and welcome to episode 116 of the PowerScore LSAT podcast. I'm Dave Kaloran in Napa Valley. And I'm John Dinning in Los Angeles. John, it's the exciting August 2022 LSAT recap episode. Are you ready? I think I'm ready. Yeah, God knows we've done enough of these. If we're not ready by now, bigger issues. If we don't know what we're doing, we should quit. <laughs> yeah. Thankfully, we know what we're doing. And quit now because we got three more of these month to month coming right up. <laughs> All but right. to, to, as a bit of a spoiler, I feel pretty good about this one. You know, there've been some tests this year that were very difficult to track and a lot of confusion that felt almost intentional. This one, I think we've got a pretty clear grasp on. So that's at least good news. I'd have to agree with you on that front. I felt pretty good about this whole test weekend. I feel like uh, we've got some good insights. So as always, what are you drinking? <laughs> as always, I am always drinking. Uh, in this case, you know, it's one of the things about a test week weekend is you always get a lot of inspiration for celebratory cocktails because that's how most people seem to spend the, their aftermath. Mm -hmm. uh, and so my drink today is actually inspired by a paper and pencil student of mine who tested yesterday. Uh, she was deep into tequila <laughs> by the nice. time she and I touched base. Um, she was drinking this 1921 tequila that I had never heard of. She recommended it. So I bought a bottle last night uh, and I've got a tequila soda. News to me, I've never heard of 1921 tequila, so. I hadn't either. So I recommended Classy Azul to her, and she recommended this. Uh, that I've heard of, but mm -hmm. I wouldn't know the difference in taste anyway, since I don't have that tequila ability. <laughs> You'd like this. It's very good. I can recommend it. I'd like it mixed with a bunch of sugar, I'm sure. Which leads me to my question. What are you drinking? <laughs> a bunch of sugar. Yeah. <laughs> uh, actually, this is not so sugary, but... Uh, I think I'm going to work my way through the old Trader Vic's uh, Tiki Bar uh, bartending guide, and mm. this is on there. This is a classic drink from way back. It's called a Beachcomber. It's a bunch of rum. It's got like triple sec in it. It's got a bunch of lime juice, and then a little cherry maraschino liqueur. Nice. So, Still on that rum kick, huh? Weren't you drinking mojitos last week? Uh-huh. Yeah, I'm not going to break that. I always drink rum. Rum yeah. and vodka are my go-tos. Notice there's not a whole lot of difference in taste between those unless it's like light dark or something. Yeah, yeah. Fair enough, a beachcomber. So anyone wants to be more ambitious than me, go make you one of those. I know that Trader Vic's uh, bartending guide you're talking about, though. There's some good stuff in there. It's a classic. There's Trader Vic's near me that I've got to go to at some point. There's a couple of really good tiki bars in the San Francisco area. Oh, Either yeah. way, I'm going to drink through the summer with a bunch of beachy tiki <laughs> drinks, and that's we're continuing on. I, I know your wife's drink-making skills, which means I don't know why you'd ever leave the house. I don't. Yeah, I just... <laughs> Couch to kitchen. <laughs> Once far as blue moon. Yeah. Um, just speaking of classics, tell me about the two songs you picked for us today, because this the, was all you. Well, the first one is, I was really bummed out. We did our last podcast, and after we finished, I started uh, catching some updates on the news, and I discovered that Olivia Newton-John had died, which really bummed me out. Yeah. Um, whatever. I kind of, you know, she was certainly bigger when uh, when I was really young, so... I've always been like, hmm, Olivia. And I would imagine that most people are like, who the heck is she? But she was in Greece as uh, Sandy, the lead song of hers that I think is great, that I still listen to on occasion is Magic. There you go. It also has a secondary meaning because I feel like, uh, as we'll soon discover, the test that we predicted that would appear as the primary usage on this exam was, in fact, the primary usage. And so I felt like Magic, it's a little bit of that. Uh, it certainly weaves well with that. And then I saw the psychedelic first uh, last Friday. Yeah. And uh, so I chose their song, Heaven, also, which is if you followed our recommendations from the crystal ball, <laughs> that's how that test should have felt to you. So two kind of related songs, all life experiential. I thought you picked Heaven for her death, but I see what you're getting at. <laughs> I don't know how to take that. You're I normally more morbid. So it feels impressed. dark to me. and. Yeah. and <laughs> I know. These songs are magic in heaven, and you're like, oh, because she died. No, it has That's nothing to do with that. I feel um, bad about her death, though. She's yeah, nice. man, I'm a sucker for an Australian, so she's a shame to see her go. Girl um, next door, man. Mm -hmm. uh, dude, that outdoor venue where you saw the psychedelic furs, you sent me some pictures of it. What a cool spot. Put that on the list the next time I'm in town. It depends on who's playing there. Uh, yeah. uh, you never know who's going to actually show up and play there, the, but they have really disparate acts. Snoop Dogg was playing there two weeks ago, uh, <laughs> but it's Krug Winery in the middle of Napa, and uh, 
It was really cool. Obviously, when you go to a winery to see a show, they serve you a lot of wine. So you yeah. can't go up and get a glass of wine. They always sell you a bottle. <laughs> so everybody has a really good time. It had a picnic-y kind of vibe to it from what I could tell, except everybody was obviously standing and rocking out. Yeah, there's some people sitting there. There's, you know, picnic blankets and stuff. It's just, a, it's a cool thing. They do that at a couple wineries around here. And I've seen some pretty good bands play. Um, so the Furs are an early 80s kind of English band, a bunch of songs that were big hits in movies and so forth. Uh, they're getting up there, though. It's, uh, I'm not sure how many more tours they're going to be doing. They might just be in heaven as well. <laughs> say we'll be doing a memoriam for them soon enough i'm sure <laughs> <laughs> it's coming let's get out of this though and into yeah. the lsat world john your class that you are personally teaching one of our live online courses starts in a week on august 24th are you happy about it i am excited man it's been several years pre-pandemic since i've had the chance to teach one of these so i'm really really looking forward to it and i just got a note from our marketing people before we I uh, hopped on here to do this, that they're probably going to close down enrollment for it fairly soon. I've insisted mm -hmm. from the very beginning, part of like the conditions of me teaching it was that I didn't want to turn it into 150 people in the room. I wanted to keep it smaller, more intimate. Um, so we are going to cap enrollment. If you're thinking about signing up for that class, I mean, it, this feels like a sales pitch, but I'd suggest you do so sooner as opposed to later because it probably will get closed. Uh, it is a sales pitch, but at the same yeah. time, it's based upon the reality of what's It's also on. true, so <laughs> don't feel too bad about it. Uh, but that'll be fun. It, it also gives me certain privileges, uh, liberties really, where I can run the classes a little longer than we typically like, so we cover more ground. I can add some additional things that I have access to, the typical instructor, even the typical company might not. So I think people who are able to attend that one are going to get a lot more um, than they might expect. It's Live Online Extra with John Denning. <laughs> There you go. Um, but yeah, that'll be fun. I'm, I'm excited. It starts next Wednesday night and runs every Wednesday for 10 weeks. And like I said, maybe I'll pop in. Maybe I won't. You're going to have to convince me to do so. <laughs> I thought I was going to have to convince you to stay away. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you can do that too if you want. We'll see how it goes. Uh, let's talk about something else You know that we've briefly mentioned before, but score preview, especially for you August test takers is now available to all test takers. And if you haven't picked up on this piece of news, it's a, it's a big one. It used to be that score preview, you see your score when all the scores are released, but it doesn't become final unless you, you know, choose to accept it and you have the option of killing off your score and having it chose a cancellation. It used to only be available to first time test takers. Uh, John, you and I lobbied for uh, really the last two years or so yeah. to have this made into something that was available to all test takers. And then under cover of night, uh, about a week and a half ago, they did that. How does that make you feel? Yeah, they did kind of change this policy very quietly, subversively almost. Um, score preview hasn't been around for that long, but we were in conversation with them before it even was uh, mm -hmm. an option telling them they should do this. And as soon as they rolled it out and made it only first timers, we again got back with feedback and said, you should make this for everyone. So in my opinion, it's a little overdue, but we can claim some credit and this is the right way to do it. So I'm happy. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's a weird policy they have too. I, 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 the way they do things sometimes from a pricing standpoint, it always <laughs> makes me like cock my head slightly. If you buy it before your test or before the test, it's $45. <laughs> if you want to buy it post test, then it's 75, which feels a little bit predatory. Like, maybe I didn't do well. Now I want to check my score. I don't love that. You know, there's no reason to prey upon people's insecurities about things like that. Yeah, Why prey, just... predatory. These aren't words that I think either of us would throw around casually. No, we certainly um, wouldn't. But, but it does feel time, that way a little bit. Why is it 30 bucks more if you do it the day after versus the day before? Come on. I don't love it. Um, and it's just one of those things where it's like, Everything's expensive these days. Why make this $30 more just because it's a timing thing? You're looking at when people are actually doing it. And I'm sure there'll be some explanation that, oh, well, we have to go back and reset something in the system. I'll be like, okay, $30, whatever. It should be 45 at all times for everybody. I can accept that. Or, frankly, just include it. It should just be part and parcel with taking the test. You pay enough to take the thing. Why are you charging me more to see the score before I have to cancel it. See, John, I went for the reasonable ask on the hope that maybe we could get it down to 45 at all times. And oh, you went for the whole baby. enchilada. Oh, no. <laughs> Slinging half-court shots over here. 
I agree. It should be included in it. And that is the case with some other tests that are standardized that are, that are big name tests. So I don't know why we're charging for it. But then again, I don't know why we charge so much for score reports to be sent to individual schools uh, either. So. Yeah, maybe we're creeping towards a happier outcome. I do feel like this is a step in the right direction, though. So it's that at least I think is, is commendable. I'll take it. And as I've mm -hmm. said before, this is going to have some effect on our ability to make comparisons year to year uh, about score bubbles and percentiles. So we'll talk more about that when we get our opportunity. Yeah. But if you're in the midst of that kind of like August aftermath test, keep in mind that the main administration dates are now over. Uh, the two primary dates were Friday and Saturday. Uh, then we had a Tuesday date. Uh, if you had a problem, you might be looking at a makeup that is going to be coming up here on Tuesday, August 23rd. The content that we are talking about on today's podcast is not content you will see. So if you had a problem and you're hoping, well, wait, I can get a, an advanced preview of what I'll see, they'll use different testing content for you. So yeah. sorry for your sake. And then uh, eventually scores will be released on Wednesday, August 31st at 9 a.m. Eastern time. So mm -hmm. 6 a.m. for you and I out in the West Coast, John. Yeah, I tend to wake up to a lot of messages on score release day. Um, generally pretty happy, but we shall see. But yeah, the 31st, last day of the month, you will uh, you'll have your score bright and early, 9 a.m. Eastern. And then after that August 31st date, you've got the September LSAT. We know the registration is now closed on that. As of a week ago, the registration was like 19,775. It's been slowly coming down since then. That is mm -hmm. normal. That's the melt that we always see. That test starts on Friday, September 9th. You'll get your email that allows you to sign up about 10 to 12 days ahead. We recommend yeah. that you sign up as soon as you possibly can because when they only have two testing days, times will disappear so don't wait on that once you get it. If you got a, especially if you have like a real need, I have to test early in the morning or later in the afternoon, you will want to sign up as soon as possible. And then we'll get the scores at the end of September from that exam. Mm -hmm. Yeah, September 28th, which is also a Wednesday, you'll get your scores. Same deal, 9 a.m. What's interesting here with these two score releases is each of them, both the August and the September, occur a day before registration deadlines for a later test. In the case of the release for August, you get your scores back on the 31st, but the last day to register for the October LSAT is September 1st. So you got a day and a half, basically. You get your scores in the morning, the deadline's the midnight the next night. Mm -hmm. um, the dates for that October test, Friday and Saturday, October 14th and 15th, scores are going to come out again on a Wednesday, in this case, November 2nd. All right, so that's the lineup of LSATs. Well, let me Here's touch on November. I might as well just run through the rest well, yeah. of 22 here. Um, scores for the September test come out Wednesday, September 28th. The registration for September, the last test of this calendar year, is midnight, September 29th. So same November, year. you mean? Uh, registration for November, yeah, I don't know what I said. Um, but September 29th is the deadline midnight that night. So again, you'll have a little over a day with a September score to contemplate November. Those test dates are November 11th and 12th, Friday and Saturday, and the release there is end of November the 30th, which is a Wednesday. And where credit is due, this is actually the logical way to do it as far as LSAC uh, is concerned, because previously we didn't have this worked out properly, and we would be having scores come out or scheduled to come out after registration yeah. uh, deadlines had closed. Now we've moved that around a little bit, so I will say that that is a positive thing. Yeah, the calendar of this makes sense. You can't always sign up for consecutive tests with a result, but at least you can sign up for um, two tests away with the result. October, you can sign up for with an August score. In November, you can sign up with a September score. And in the midst of all that, we'll be doing our usual slate of free seminars. I'm not going to list all of them because they just, you know, we run them every couple of weeks or so, but they're free. You could sign up at powerscore.com forward slash free seminars on the 31st. Uh, actually, the day of score release, we've got a basic conditional reasoning seminar coming up mm -hmm. on September 13th. We've got an advanced conditional reasoning. Uh, so, you know, the one-two punch there. And then, John, on September 20th, a mere month from now, amazingly enough, oh, yeah. we have a crystal ball that we're going to point towards the October and November LSATs. And if we can get anywhere as close as we got this past time, it'll be worth everyone's time. Yeah, the bar really hasn't come down at all, has it? It's no, it hasn't. Way up there. Um, we'll talk uh, a little bit touch more. On this a lot. Yeah. Yeah, about that prediction, and maybe even talk a little bit about how rare what 
the moment in time that we're going through right now is. But let's move on to the August 2022 LSAT and break it down from start to finish. Yeah. So one just quick detail again to recap. You'll get your scores on Wednesday, the 31st of August, 9 a.m. in the morning. But this is true for everyone. It doesn't matter which day you took it on, including retakers who test next Tuesday. Everyone who's got a completed writing sample will get their scores at that point. If you haven't done the writing sample yet, hustle up. It takes a little while for them to process it, but go do it if you don't have one on record. Uh, and like I said, October registration ends the next day at midnight. So you've got a little time, but not a lot. Yeah. And score previewers also get their scores on that date. And then Good they point. have, uh, you know, a set number of days to make Six a decision. Six calendar once days they see to make it. a cancel decision. Exactly. Yeah. So as we break it down, what we had was if you look at this test, it's going to turn out that just under 17,000 or so people tested in actuality on Friday, Saturday, and then the Tuesday test. And it's really interesting to watch how that compares to last year, as well as even watching the melt as, as time went on here. If you go back to last August, so mm -hmm. August to August comparison, 2021 versus 2022, in August 2021, there were 25,373 people registered to take the test on the morning it started. Uh, as of, I think, um, August 17th, kind of like just giving us the, the, the final data that they're reporting, mm -hmm. there were 18,478 people for this one. So uh, almost a 7,000 person difference between the two exams. That's really an extraordinarily smaller group. And if you're looking at how that affects the upcoming cycle, fewer applicants means fewer, you know, less competition, uh, you know, more available spots per person. And so ultimately, you'd say that's a good thing. We do have the September test, which is a fairly substantial test right now. Uh, so it's, we're not going to really be able to say how this plays out until we get a little bit more time passed and we're able to actually see the number of people who are registered for September, October, and November yeah. who actually are there. Uh, so we won't know, but right now, on a test-to-test -test basis, this is looking like a smaller cycle. It's not going to be this small in the final analysis, but it, it right now you'd have to say it's tending towards smaller. Yeah, about 7,000 people, I think, when we get the final head count year to year, smaller, which is significant. And somebody might ask, well, you know, if the registration shows 18,478, why is the number of test takers, you just said it was just less than 17,000? Because some people don't show up. Yeah, uh, about 1,500 people in this case. Yeah, they have a number that says this was what we had the morning of the test, and then there's loss on that as well. And the way it broke out was on Friday, I had about 8,200 people take the test. Saturday, I had about 8,500. And then on Tuesday, which is primarily uh, pencil and paper, you had 250. And that gets you to about 16,950 somewhere in there. So mm -hmm. very interesting the way that there's so many different ways to count test takers here from registration to who actually shows to reportable scores, a lot of different options. Yeah. And for those looking at September, because I know that's on a lot of people's minds, uh, even those tuning in to hear about August, it's going to be roughly the same number. September might be a little smaller, but to echo your advice from before, with anything like this kind of size over two days, slots fill up. So as soon as you get the opportunity to pick a day and time, go do it. Don't delay. Your time might get gobbled up. Yeah. And on top of that, you know, given the fact that it was two fairly sizable days, uh, we didn't have too many problems. Mm -hmm. And I always, I always qualify that if you had a problem, it's the worst thing in the world and it's super <laughs> annoying. Um, but we didn't see the type of widespread outages that we've seen in the past, uh, things being knocked off online, major ProctorU breakdowns. We didn't have that. It was a relatively smooth administration. Yes, you and I both talked to individual students who had delays, problems, who got kicked into the, the makeup test. Sure. That's why they have a makeup test. Uh, it appeared that there was some type of issue with LSAC issued devices for a bit, but even that seemed to go away eventually. Uh, so overall, the focus of our discussion here is going to be on test content. It's not going to be on some kind of massive failure on the part of LSAC or ProctorU. We've had those podcasts before. Yeah. This isn't one of them, thankfully. I was going to say, yeah, I know you and I are both grateful not to have to do some sort of reporting on disaster. I hate it. Because <laughs> you just know that a bunch of people were affected adversely yeah, at a moment of great stress and knowing that this test was, was hugely important. So anybody who did have a problem, you know exactly what I'm saying when, when I talk about how bad it is. Even yeah. I lost two minutes in a section. To me, that's crisis time because that could be the difference uh, of several points, several questions. 
I don't like it. But right now, this is the system that we have. Maybe we'll see some changes next year, but we're certainly not going to see any changes this year. Yeah. And you also can't really divorce yourself from the experience, the negative experience of having had that problem. So somebody who gets two minutes stolen in section two lives with the burden of that and the mm-hmm. reminiscence of it, the trauma maybe, for the rest of the test. Um, even if that's your only problem, that problem doesn't just go away once it's over or solved. Like, yeah. Like, and no. I talked to one student who was like, you know, did my timer stop? Uh, you know, the proctor said that it stopped automatically. I'm like, it didn't. If they didn't stop it, it didn't stop. And that probably is pushing them into a retake because, you know, they don't know how much time they lost. They've, right. They're like, well, I, it was more than a few minutes. The proctor can pause the timer. We know this is the case. There are different rules about it. Proctors say different things, but always tell your proctor, pause it. Even if they say, oh, I can't do that, be like, it's a lie. And he knows, maybe I'll get a message from LSDC that says, no, that's not actually how it works. But it's funny because I've had students have their tests paused by the proctor. So it works that way somehow. <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. I, I talked to students who had that experience both days, Friday and Saturday. So <laughs> as of this recording, it is the way it works. And yeah, I don't know that anyone's going to say it's contrary, but I have heard before, it's like, well, you can't just stop it. You have to do this and this. I'm like, right, but you can still stop it eventually. So... <laughs> John, let's get into the test. Yeah, we always lead into this with this laundry list of explanations and disclaimers and things that I I think are relevant and necessary, although a little tedious. You always do it. Do you want to keep the honors? Sure. I thought for a minute you might volunteer. Maybe what I should do in the future is read this at a super high rate of speed. You know, like the end of a commercial where you're like, terms of disclaimers. (laughs) And then they just go through it super fast. Side effects may include. (laughs) Uh, I won't do that though, because I, despite the fact that it is a long list of disclaimers, it's really not so much a disclaimer as an explanation yeah. of how we do what we do just a little bit. We don't give away the entire truth uh, or farm of what we're doing, but it, it kind of explains some of the things we're doing, some of the ideas behind how we analyze this, because we get a lot of questions where people are like, how do you do this? Why do I know that it works? And one of the reasons I'd say why is go listen to every other prior recap podcast. Uh, They're like 99% accurate in terms of what we're doing. And so there's a lot of background to it. And if you're a first time listener, don't skip over this section because it actually is really helpful. First off, though, we're not disclosing anything that is secret or confidential. That doesn't mean that it won't be new to a lot of people because John and I are fortunate to sit in a position after years of experience that we can piece things together that can't necessarily be seen. So they're public knowledge, but they might be invisible to most others who are out there. And occasionally we reference that here. We'll also make the point that your section order is irrelevant to the content. You can have two test takers with identical test content, getting them in different orders. This is normal. Also, content changes throughout the day. At every single test administration, we see people saying, you mean people have different tests? Yes. You might have one reading comprehension section. You might have a friend take it two hours later or a day later, and they have a different reading comprehension section in a different position on the test. There are multiple configurations of this exam, both in order and in content. That is to help LSAC stop people from cheating and sharing information and subverting the integrity of the test. So just be aware of that. One of the things that we know is that LSAC will allow you after the test, especially you know once the main test administration closes, to talk about the generalities of the exam, your order, the topics, the type. What they don't want during the test is discussion of specifics. They don't want you talking about solutions, questions to avoid, games to avoid. They don't want you speculating on the experimental. They want you to t- wait until the main testing days are over. So a lot of information that we get is really from students that we talk to. We also have a huge database of prior test information that goes back years and years. And we can connect information that someone tells us about a question, a topic, or several topics to be like, that's this section and we know a whole bunch about it. That's partially how we're able to figure things out and to make assessments of scaling and difficulty. When you're thinking about what we say about test section difficulty, I would just use this particular reminder. Taking the real LSAT always feels worse than taking a practice test. The two experiences are not the same. So if you come out and you're like, I felt way worse about that, 
that's normal. There's nothing wrong with you. It's, you know that it's real. It's stressful. It's pressure filled. It's like practicing a speech. You can practice in front of the mirror 50 times. That's not the same thing as actually standing on the podium, giving the speech. And that's what happens with the LSAT. Uh, it feels worse. And because of that, a lot of times a negativity bias creeps into a person's recollections about the exam. Like that was the hardest game section ever. No, it wasn't, but it certainly felt that way to you. And we're not discounting that. We're just recognizing that context matters here. And when we say something's easier or harder, keep in mind that it's all about relative difficulty. I've said on a hundred occasions before, I think every section of the LSAT is hard. They're already high difficulty. The question is, is it easier within a high difficulty band or harder within a high difficulty band? That is something we can talk about and feel pretty comfortable. But if I say something like that was the easier of the two sections, I'm not saying it was easy. Don't make the relativity flaw. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm just saying it was easier, but it was still going to be hard. Keep this in mind too. The test makers are actively attempting to confuse you by placing the same topic in multiple sections across multiple days of the test. We've seen this many times in the past. So if you're talking to a friend and you're like, oh, I had that passage on Nigeria, you may not be talking about the same passage. We have seen test administrations where there were two entirely separate reading comprehension passages that focused on Nigeria. Different questions, different kind of way it goes. I can use a hundred different examples too in places like LR. Oh, I had the speeding question. You didn't have the speeding question that was the same as the other person. So be careful about you know, talking and thinking I have the same thing, or even if you had the same order. Uh, this has been happening for a while now. It's a known tactic that we know that they use. Whenever we're looking at what's real or experimental, we make certain assumptions about reusage. And that assumption is prior scored sections were not reused as experimental. If something was previously scored, it's going to be scored again. So far, that's held true. I don't see them breaking that. It would seem like a waste of, of section use. Um, and opportunity to test experimentals, but just be aware that that is an assumption that we have here. It's also possible that during this discussion, you don't hear your section talked about. We think we have them all, but sometimes we don't mention the exact questions that you recall. Sometimes there's sections floating around out there that weren't given to that many people. And if those people don't contact us and give us data points, we don't have a way of knowing that it actually existed. Information is definitely being limited online by the test makers, which is fine, but that does make it harder for us to cross-reference our database and actually figure this out. Almost to the end, John. You're doing so, great. Yeah. One You're last like thing that, that I will add, and I always add this, is that we would request that you not summarize this online. And the reason is very simple. First off, this podcast is free. Anybody who wants this information can come access it and it doesn't cost them a thing. A lot of times when I see online summaries, it has no nuance to it. It's just like, well, they said it was minus eight for this and it was minus nine for that. And that's it. And I'm like, we said so much more that can make people feel better about their experience. We try to give contextual information that lends perspective. So we would just prefer that people hear what we have to say about it directly. We even put timestamps on these podcasts. You can go right to the discussion. So yeah. Again, request that you not summarize it. Just point them to the podcast so they can spend the time with us. John, that's it. <laughs> Solid effort as usual, man. Um, that was more expensive like than usual. Yeah. I don't know. I feel like you, you need a timeout. Some orange slices or something. Uh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> right before I started that, I took a, a sip of this drink. Oh, and it was almost all rum. <laughs> I just, I just, I I just had a giant tequila time. gulp and my eyes are watering. <laughs> I was like, what? It was rough. Well, you did you did well. Um, let's do this. Let's get into the details of the test. And what we typically would do at this point are uh, touch on basically some of the less um, called popular, less attended test versions, like international tests, if any had happened. They didn't this time. Or the paper and pencil test that was administered yesterday. The good news for us here is the paper and pencil test by all reports that I have gotten and seen yesterday is going to match with the exact details that we saw over the weekend for regular online domestic mm -hmm. LSAT test takers. So I think we can table paper and pencil discussion and just loop it in to the main test discussion to come. Yes. So this is what we'll do then. As usual, we're going to separate it out by section type and talk about each section type and what we saw as real. And in some cases, what we saw as experimental. Uh, I think both you and I feel like we have a pretty good grasp of what was given. 
I think LSAC has stopped that kind of uh, environment where they are giving 54 or 45 different versions of the test. The, the numbers are a little bit uh, smaller in terms of the variation, which makes our life a lot easier. Um, yeah. It's not perfect, but we think we have a fairly good grasp of this. There's always the possibility, too, that some very fringe uh, set of content snuck its way through. Maybe somebody who'd seen some of this before or, again, an outlier situation. But this will include, exhaustively include, the entirety of what we saw based on reports that we've gotten back. And I only yeah. saw eight total combinations here, so not too bad. That's exactly uh, what I saw as well. And I'll point something out. If the content of the eight combinations, if you've taken the LSAT a few times and you'd seen this, they'll give you a different test. Mm -hmm. You might have been the one of a very few people who got a different test. So if you're like, wait, that wasn't mine, well, tell us. We'd love to hear from you uh, about that. And then we'll just add that to the list of sections that they used here. But there wouldn't have been many of you. Yeah, I've been positively fidgeting here to get to the first point I'm about to make, which is about test reuse and the one that we saw first thing Friday morning uh, and how gratifying this turned out to be. Um, when we woke up Friday and started to see reports, particularly of games, which are often one of the easiest things to match, we saw right away that they were using the test that we predicted that they would use, which in this case was a reuse of the January 2020 LSAT. And it turned out they used three sections, games, reading comp, and LR, from that test here. So it wasn't just a partial reuse, it was more or less cover to cover. Um, for people confused by what I'm talking about, when they don't disclose an LSAT, in other words, they don't make it available publicly to the people who took it or to people who might want to purchase it after the fact, they keep it in reserve with the option to reuse it down the road. For years and years, this is how they treated the February exams every year. With more tests recently and fewer disclosed, they have a lot of options to pull from. The January 2020 test was non-disclosed, so it was sitting there really begging for reuse. And sure enough, we saw that coming, we predicted it, and that's exactly what they did. Yeah, and if you're like thinking, what are they talking about? Go look up non-disclosed tests or non-disclosed LSATs and get a little bit more insight. But we've been tracking this. We talk about it in every recap podcast. It's a big feature of our crystal balls because we're able to track what they do with these exams and then feed that back into our crystal ball prediction and then make changes based on that. And in the last crystal ball for this particular exam, what I said was this is the number one target. This is the test that is most likely to be used. And so as soon as I heard about breweries being used yeah. early, early Friday morning, I was like, today's going to be a good day. I should have just <laughs> chosen Ice Cube as the, uh, as the, the artist of the day. And it's going to be a good day. <laughs> today's a good day. I was like, this is going to be nice. And I think I sent you a text that was like, yeah, it's January 2020. I think you spotted it first because you're usually awake hours before me. Yeah, I'm up earlier than you. So yeah. uh, I felt very good about that. And if you're thinking, well, who cares? Remember that when we go into the crystal ball and we have a feeling that they're going to be using one test or another or that there's a certain set of targets, we shape the problem sets that we yeah. recommend that everybody do. And it's usually based on connecting to some of the things that we know are in that section. Because of course, when people took that test in January, 2020, it also included experimental sections that went back to or partial uses from like June 2017 and June 2018. We knew what all those games were. We understood what they were. So we could say, well, was this a grouping game or a linear game? Oh, it was a grouping game that had this particular feature. Let's go recommend in our next crystal ball that people do this game, which mm -hmm. has a similar feature. That is why the problem sets always change from test to test. So I have said this before, the ability of that we have had recently, I don't know if this is eight or nine now times that we have predicted which tests that they would use. John, these are, from an LSAT standpoint, it's extraordinary. I've never seen anything like it. I don't, I never thought I'd live in a period where I could do this and yeah. same for you. Eventually it will end. I was going to say, I don't think you're going to live in it forever. I will not. And, uh, but we are going through unusual times and I've explained elsewhere why it is that we're capable of doing this. They don't have enough tests developed and I'm sure they're furiously developing them because this doesn't make them happy. But uh, until they get those tests out and into the stream, we're able to predict it. And it is working amazingly. One of the first messages I got was from a student who was like, it was the exact test that you said, and I felt so comfortable. Everything yeah. I was seeing was right on the nose. And I was like, that's my job. 
We do LSAT preparation. It's our entire goal at PowerScore to help people get better at this test and improve. And if I can give you a sense of comfort during the test, man, that's worth gold. Yeah, I'm glad you explained it the way you did, too, because I think a lot of people tend to be impressed, call it in principle. Like, oh, wow, you guys saw this coming, too. But they don't always see what's practical about that or pragmatic. And, of course, what is is the fact that when we have a strong suspicion as to what they're going to use and we know a little bit about it, we can make recommendations tailored to exactly what that content is best represented by on disclosed tests. So you can't go do January 2020. It doesn't exist in the wild. But you can do things that are close approximations of it that we can tell you to do. And I, again, I can only speak from the reports that I was hearing back. And I know you got a lot of them too. People who attended that crystal ball, worked their way through the problem sets, had an eye to our expectations, were so well served by this, man. I got message after message easily into like the triple digits of messages of people being like, I can't believe how prepared I felt. And it's because I had done this game or I'd read this passage or you told me to do this set of LR. Triple this digits. is why we do it. I don't know if I'm, that's a lot. <laughs> you, you saw what Reddit did to me. Um, I know you had a lot of Reddit messages. I'm still pulling the pieces of myself back together. It was... <laughs> I'll make one last comment on it, which is this, is that we've done it now so many times that I think it starts to feel like passe. Like, oh, yeah. you know, that's just a feature. People are able to do it. No, I know exactly what it is that's happening. And I'm like, it's going to end soon. I know it's going to end soon. So I'm always amazed when it works out. I'm always elated for our students that it worked out. But this is not something that anyone can really take for granted because it, it shouldn't be the case. This is not something you should be able to do for any test, whether it's the SAT or the GMAT. It's like having a professor and saying, uh, that professor is going to use his exam from fall 2017. <laughs> you know, you can go back and talk to people from that period of time and learn about it. It's just not that you have the pages in the course book to know because that's what the questions are about. Like, mm -hmm. That's what we're able to do here. Yeah, go read this, this, and this is where the questions came from. Mm. That's, it'll end. <laughs> John, on that lengthy self congratulatory note, yeah. deserve it. We might have just ended it. <laughs> <laughs> we might have yeah, yeah, Anybody ended else it. Like listening to that, it's like, well, no, they're <laughs> mad. <laughs> We're going to change it. Uh, <laughs> but I sometimes students said, that's no big deal. I'm like, you don't understand. You don't it's understand the biggest deal I think that I've probably ever been involved in. And I've been doing LSAT prep for well over 20 years. It's nothing like this has ever happened. Yeah. 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 So let's start with that January 2020. You referenced one of the games, which is breweries. If you don't mind, let me just run through all Hit four. It. Okay. So we saw these coming out right out of the gate on Friday morning as a real section because it was the only games that people were seeing on their test. These were the four. 23 questions, January 2020. The first game was about school project assignments, student presentations, essentially. The second game, somewhat generically, people traveling to various towns. The third game, which got a little more attention because it was very time consuming, was about senior and junior employees being distributed to different um, I, teams, I think, leadership, management, production teams. And then the most notorious, certainly the most talked about, um, was the fourth game, which was about three breweries serving three types of beer, lager, port, and stout, over the span of nine weeks. And we'd seen this actually come up earlier than January 2020. This was in June of uh, 17 and 18 as experimental. So this is a game with a bit of history to it, but also very recognizable. Um, as soon as we saw breweries, we were like, nailed it. Yeah, and not an easy game either. Hardest game in that way. set, for sure. Uh, That's I, the one that most people complain about. Yeah. Although a bit inspirational for when the test was done. I can't tell you how many messages I also got about, like, should I have a lager or a stout? <laughs> That's what I like to see the LSAT I getting said into our both. world. Yeah, and I remember beforehand, you and I looking at this test prior to the last crystal ball and being like, okay, looking at some of the features that we knew were in these games and searching for the games that we wanted to tell people to do that yeah. had similarity. So when they stopped using this section, they actually flipped over to a different section uh, that was also ended up being a real. And John, to my knowledge, there was no experimental logic games that were administered this weekend. I did not see anyone get double games the entire time. And that includes yesterday with the paper and pencil. Mm -hmm. So to our way of seeing this and the reports that we received from students, uh, there were only two sections. So if you didn't have that brewery section, then you had the other scored section that we're aware of. And that had the following games on it. A uh, game about nonprofit uh, kind of charity game that include reserved and unreserved seats at five different sporting events like football, hockey, judo, et cetera. A game about jewels like quartz and rubies um, in six different cases. 
Mm-hmm. And then a game about four posters and four train stations over a couple different months, September, October, November. And this last game was tricky. Uh, yeah. Again, you know, we're seeing the most difficult game on, on the typical LSAT section being the fourth one. Uh, John, I'll, I'll, I'll leave you to make the comment about how we felt we set people up for this game. Oh, yeah. No, I'm thrilled to get the credit here. Thank you. Um, I didn't say credit. I just said I'd let you set it up. Yeah, I knew what I said, too. <laughs> so, <laughs> now, when we put together the recommended problem sets before we did this crystal ball for this test, um, one of the things that we were really looking at closely was the reappearance of a pattern game. You talked about it in the crystal ball as well when you were going through games. You said, listen, if some outlier does appear, it's almost certainly going to be of this type. You gave a list of every outlier game, including circular and mapping, but pattern most importantly, uh, so that people could go practice. But the recommended pattern game that we had first on our list for people to do was from June 2014. It's the fourth game there about people trading work pieces over a four-day work week from Monday to Thursday. The fourth game in this real section here in August, the one about posters and train stations, it's about as close a facsimile or approximation of that other pattern game we told people to do as I think I've ever seen. Uh, So anyone who had actually taken our advice to the letter and done this work pieces game from June 14, they weren't just well served for this posters game. It was literally free points. So that was one of the most gratifying things that I saw the whole time. It was nice getting the test right. But knowing we had told people essentially what to do for this maybe hardest game of the eight real ones, God, man, that felt great. And I heard from just an yeah. uncountable number of people as to how much it helped. Uh, I really think that, you know, when it comes down to it, LSAT prep is like, hey, doing games from the past so that you are prepared for what they throw in the future. The past is prologue when it comes to this. Logic sure. doesn't change. They just change the presentation. Um, so... You know, us telling people to do specific games, we've been doing that for years. But in a case like this, we're like, this is probably the closest thing to some of the stuff we've been seeing them do that you would actually see. And if you've done that game beforehand, sometimes people get lucky. They just do games like that randomly. And they're like, oh, my gosh. I had somebody tell me the LR question that I did was really similar to this other LR question I did this week. Like, everything felt the same. Uh, It's the same thing here. You're going to feel pretty good. Uh, but both of those sections, they're the two real sections. So breweries being one of them, and then this kind of like train station games being the other section, both end with those tough games. Uh, we'll come back at the end here and do the scale matrix and kind of explain that all together. But you should have had one of those two sections. Yeah, I get to just keep beating our own drum. I, uh, I don't tutor a lot of people. I've got a few floating around. I had one who tested Saturday. Thursday, so 48 hours before her test, in our tutoring session together, this was the game that we did, June 2014 work pieces. I was like, you need to know this. Let's go through it. She kind of got it. I was like, let's go through it again. She texted me after her test on Saturday and was like, I I don't know how to thank you, but you saved me. And it's not me. It's just the right kind of exposure to the right stuff at the right time. And it was luck of the draw, too, because she could have gotten the breweries game. And she could have had the other diff- real section of games. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, I think she'd have still been well served by just the thought process of it. But having done basically the same game two days before, oh, she's cartwheeling around knowing that it would have been catastrophe had she not. Yeah. LSAT prep companies for years have always given generalized recommendations. Hey, we think you should do these games and you know this grouping, this, this linear stuff. This is the same thing. It just happens to be a lot more finely refined and uh, honed uh, to what you have in the past. So... Hopefully, you know, join us for the next crystal ball if you're taking one of those LSATs. It's the best, best, best way I can say this. And, and if you're thinking, man, these guys are talking a lot about this. Yeah, we are. Yeah. I would have to say, John, you and I are both elated that th- this worked out the way that it did. It's hard not to have a high from it and feel, I think, pretty much on top of the world. About yeah, it. <laughs> it doesn't always show when we're feeling great. You and I are both kind of notoriously Irish. But when, yeah, when it goes this well, it's hard not to celebrate ourselves. I mean... I feel so good about what we're able to do for people here. So let's get into the reading comprehension. And yeah. here we'll talk a little bit about experimentals because we did see them and they're a little bit easier to find. So I'm going to start with a couple real sections and then we'll move into the experimental sections. So here's the first of the real sections. It is off that January 2020 LSAT. Uh, this is a tricky section overall. Mm-hmm. 
deals with international cyber security and regulating illegal activities, deals with a Native American mobilian jargon, kind of like pigeon language exchange. You'll often see pigeon being used uh, as the descriptor, not, not like the bird, but P-I-D-G-I-N. Then there's the science of aging, about lifespan and genes, cell senescence, yep. and then art forgeries. I love, I'd love. i like a good art forgery passage to read, so I hope I see this soon. About art replicas and their aesthetic value, Van Meegeren and Vermeer's. Uh, that's the comparative. That's a tough passage, probably the hardest on there. Not to say that people love cell senescence, because most <laughs> science passages drive people crazy. Yeah, that's fair. I just watched a documentary on Van Meegeren, like, Two weeks ago. So to have gotten that passage, if it was me, I would have been, yeah. You would have been it, feeling it, like excited. Yeah, been like, luck I of the this. draw. Yeah, very much so. Even though it's comparative, so there's a little more to hash out. Yeah. So anyway, what you have there is that's a real section. We know that that was scored. That came from January 2020. I'll go to the other section that we know was real as well. Uh, also 27 questions, if I recall correctly. Uh, this is maybe not as hard as the other one. But uh, not to say that it doesn't have some difficulty. Uh, Mexican photographer Graciela Itaberde and her photo Mujer Angel. Angel? I don't know. I tried it. I, I get my best it. shot at a, at a good uh, Spanish accent. <laughs> I think it's just angel woman. But yeah, it's a lady <laughs> kind of taken from behind holding a boombox as she walks through a, a uh, desert I have landscape. to give that shot. Yeah. Oh, that's it. not bad. So a little comparison. Yeah, Graciela. That's a beautiful name. Uh, then a passage about water user and management, privatization of water and utilities. That was the comparative passage. Uncivil and civil disobedience was another passage. And then Galileo making a mistake about Dante's Inferno. A lot of people just call this Galileo and Dante. Yeah, so I have to assume th that was about some essays that Galileo wrote trying to actually measure the Inferno from the Divine Comedy. Sure, whatever you say. <laughs> oh, read a book. <laughs> <laughs> I read plenty, as you are well aware. You're the last person I could criticize with that. Uh, so both of those sections were real. Uh, neither one of them easy. Uh, let's go and take a look at some of the experimental passages and sections that we had. We had a section that was about the African-American sculptor Edmonia Lewis, which mm -hmm. there was a passage about Edmonia Lewis several years back going to show that you have – People making this test who have areas of knowledge, and they will make multiple passages on the same topics. Serotonin being a great example from the old days of the LSAT. I always think about bees dancing. The waggle dance of the bees waggle. is another one. Mm -hmm. uh, so here you've got uh, the sculptor and the influence of her heritage. Uh, a passage about double jeopardy legal doctrine and its continued use. Uh, a passage about curiosity drive theory. And then a passage about migration and breeding patterns of two bird species, falcons and sandpipers, that are being affected by climate change. That is the comparative passage. Uh, this was an experimental section that I don't think was as hard as either of the real sections. Yeah, I can promise you there's a lot of bummed out people right now. Um, because when people got these paired RCs, the one they were hoping was real was this Edmonia Lewis and migration of falcons. It's not real. I'm afraid it's unscored. So... We're sorry about that. It was the easier of the pair, but unfortunately doesn't count. Uh, let's look at the other experimental section, and I'm irritated immediately because I should have realized that I, there was a different drink I should have had today. Uh, <laughs> I thought about it too late, too. Chile and Peru claiming the name Pisco for their brandy. I should have had a Pisco Sour, man. I just want some brandy. Thinking? Whatever. I'm mad yeah. about it. <laughs> Uh, a passage about gothic fiction and vampires, which mentions Dracula and Twilight. I mean, I remember hearing about this at some point when they experimented it before, and here they've experimented it again. But Twilight, mm -hmm. really? Yeah, I saw a comment of like, wow, well, I didn't expect to see Edward Cullen come up on the LSAT today. <laughs> Man, but whatever. Sure enough. The notion of defining cause and psychologists struggling to determine causal relationships was another passage. And then the comparative passage on this test, or on this passage section, was equality and efficiency in the stock market, dealing with behavioral finances. And again, this is probably a medium difficulty section, and it was experimental. So your real passage set uh, was going to be that kind of like pigeon language and senescence and Vermeer as one. And then the other one was going to be about the Mexican photographer and like a boombox in the picture, uh, civil and uncivil disobedience and Galileo and Dante. That was your other real RC. Yeah, both of which I think the two real RCs here are both harder than the two experimental. 
based on reports. I'd have to agree with you on that. That takes us to logical reasoning. Any yeah, the, about that? the notoriously toughest thing for us to pin down. Uh, but I feel like we had a pretty good handle on this one, in part because January 2020 was in full use. Yeah, and so the first thing that we did was we pulled up our test file, and January 2020 was not that long ago, so we have a ton of information. That allows us to continue to just fill in more and more and backfill information on that test where we realize, oh, that connects to this. So these reuses, sometimes people say, like, oh, this probably makes it confusing. No, actually, it's fantastic for us because we actually can make sure that what we knew about the test before is still 100% accurate, and we can see any differences in what they're doing, uh, and sometimes we get enhanced knowledge about the exam. So let's focus on the real sections, John, and I think we'll bypass talking about experimentals, and I'm going to tell you why. I've, I've noticed that in doing these podcasts before, sometimes students are like, wait, that question was in this section, and they get it kind of confused at times, and sometimes we get it confused, too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we can focus on the sections we know were real, and I think that makes it easier to just highlight that and not throw out any confusing experimental topics. Because in games and reading comp, there's if you have experimental one of those, you only have eight of those. If you have an experimental LR, you've now got 50 samples, 25 right. real, 25 experimental floating around. I think that's too confusing. Let's focus on the real. Yeah, so if you hear us rattle off a LR topic here, it was scored. If you can only remember one of these from some section, that section counted. Yeah, and maybe there's other real sections out there. As we've said, there can be some strays. Maybe there's one that didn't make its way to us, but we didn't hear about them. If that's the case, you as the student need to tell us what's actually going on. And if you're like, I didn't have any of these sections, send us a message. We'd love to hear about it. Yeah, yeah. And if we haven't heard about it yet, it's your fault. Uh, not you, Dave. <laughs> not Listen me. to you. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> Let's hit but it. here's what we did here. I uh, feel like we've got a pretty good grip on one real section that we saw first thing Friday morning, often paired with a uh, experimental reading comp. So pretty easy to distinguish as scored. Had these questions in it, 26 questions in total, I believe, uh, with topics on insulin and myopia, so how it affects vision, tree rings, question a lot of people talked about, about electric versus gas petroleum vehicles and the manufacture of these things. Planetary moons, another question that got a lot of attention was people catching frogs, putting them into boxes of various heights, and trying to determine how high frogs could leap. I believe it was a flaw question. I heard um, a lot of people talking about that. Yeah, that one, frogs hopping around. Got frogs a lot of, jumping. A lot of people remember that. Uh, ancient charcoal cave writings, paintings, drawings. Uh, another one that got a lot of attention, which was about CFCs, Earth's ozone carbon emissions. It was one about salmon and insecticide use in this section, caffeine and coffee and tea. And then technological innovations powered by a million dollar investment. All of those single section scored. All scored. So if you're like, I remember that, that was my first section, that was your real LR. And if you remember it and it was your third section, that was your real LR. It doesn't matter where it appears, it's going to be real on all forms. What about the other section that we saw? Yeah, slightly easier for us because this is the January 2020 content once again rearing its head. Uh, I saw more of this Friday afternoon and Saturday, but certainly it's it's appeared since. Um, and this for the paper and pencil people should be particularly relevant. Uh, 26 questions again, I believe, again from January 2020 with topics on reptiles and birds in a zoo exhibit or annex, uh, male and female dragonflies in their preferred habitat. There's a question about Romeo and Juliet and their unrealistic portrayal in theater. Mm -hmm. Wastewater treatment, fuel cell, electricity, and storage. Uh, Mesopotamian recipe book. In cuneiform. In cuneiform, that's exactly right. <laughs> um, synthetic blood supply or artificial blood. Oil wells and pipelines, uh, a question that got a lot of attention, which was running barefoot versus running with shoes. And and injuries. Back and forth and injuries, exactly. Yep. Um, a couple more. Childhood education, rhyming and non-rhyming, and language skills. And then finally, a question on entrees and side dishes, which I don't think was the Mesopotamian recipe book, but it's possible. Yeah. And so that was the other section of LR that we saw um, predominantly. Those mm -hmm. two, if, if they weren't everybody, they were many, many people. And so you should have had one of those two. And if not, like I said, let us know. Uh, but always tough with LR. We felt great about the fact that we were able to isolate some single LR users uh, after the test and figure out exactly what was going on with that. That always makes it a lot easier. So 
Uh, at that point, that's the scored content of this test. And what really remains, John, is for us to figure out what the scaling is of the various form combinations. So I'm going to, again, it's not a disclaimer, it's by way of explanation. Sure. Kind of run through how we set this up and then we'll kind of talk through each section briefly and uh, assign it a value here. What we're gonna talk about here is the number of questions that you can miss to achieve 170, all right? That's, it's not a curve, but it, everyone calls it a curve, so even we call it a curve. This is the yeah. equating process of the test. Each LSAT is different, uh, and what happens is, is they predetermine curves and scales by the use of experimental sections. So they walk in knowing how they think people will actually do. And with these kind of reduced uh, tests where there's really only around 75 questions or so that contribute to your final score, the baseline that we start off with to miss the number of questions is seven. So on an average test, we would say you could miss seven questions and that would get you right around 170 or so. And then we go through this matrix and what, what you do is you, you listen for the real section that you had, like, oh, that was my logic games. And then we will adjust that minus seven up, down, or not at all, depending upon the difficulty. So if a section has zero impact, you'd stay at minus seven. If you're like, no, that's gonna loosen the scale, you go from seven to now you can miss eight questions. And the way that works is this. If you have a harder section, relatively speaking, they loosen the curve because they're trying to get into the middle, ultimately. If you have an easier section, they tighten the curve. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we have that happen as well, but minus seven is that, uh, it's kind of like a starting point that has really worked for us. So as we go through this, we'll talk about how this goes. Yeah, and for uh, anyone listening, that should make sense. How do you keep the distribution of people consistent across tests that vary slightly in difficulty? Well, easier tests, they make you get more right. Harder tests, they don't require as many right. So this is really just about raw scores translating into something scaled. We just do it at a single marker, not all the way up and down. That and marker being a 170. Yeah, and it's it's for 170. So sometimes the impact is different. In fact, that'll come up in one we're of the conversation yeah, points sure. here where it might be different at 150 or 160, but at 170, you're talking about the highest scores on this test. You're talking about the top couple percentiles. Um, the standard of, of performance is, hey, that might have felt hard, but if you're a 170 score, it shouldn't have been hard. And so it might not move the curve the same way. And when John and I are on the border, and sometimes we don't always agree, but if we're uncertain, we always go more conservative. So if the choice was no impact versus loosening the scale and we we're really uncertain about it, we'd say keep it the same. That way you don't get an unpleasant surprise on score release day. Which with yeah, score preview always better should to err be. on the side of conservative if you have to err. Yeah. And score preview takes away that unpleasant surprise problem by and large. I'm a big advocate of score preview just for peace of mind, by the way. It seems mostly psychological, but I'm all for that. Um, mm -hmm. What score preview won't do for these non-disclosed tests, unfortunately, is include your curve. You'll see a score, you'll see its percentile, but you won't know how many you got right and wrong, nor obviously exactly what you got right and wrong. And that's a good point to close with before we get into the matrix. This is a non-disclosed test, which means they can reuse it again in the future if they want. So it might be two or three years from now, we're having the same conversation with a whole new group of test takers but you won't be able to see the questions. You won't be able to see that you got this one right or you know you crushed that last game that you didn't think you did well on. So just be aware of that. John, starting at minus seven, let's talk about the first uh, logic game section. And I think this is one that a lot of people are really interested in hearing about. That was the one about the school presentations, junior, senior employees, and then the famous breweries and beer game. Yeah. Uh, I think you and I have <laughs> I a, did the same exhale. A, mixed, a, yeah. a mixed response to this. And this is the way I'll break this down, and then you can uh -huh. agree or disagree. I know that this section, this last game is hard. All right. I think at the 170 level, it's not going to move the needle. I don't think it changes it at 170. Do I think it changes it at 160? Yes. I do think that it loosens it downscale, but at the 170 level, this is probably no change to your minus seven curve. And I know a bunch of people are like, ah, go to hell. Um, I'm not trying to get that response. I am saying it has an effect, but I don't think it does at the very top. And as I've said before, you and I know a lot about this game section. I'm pretty comfortable with that. Yeah, if, if I had to nudge it off of a zero, I'd probably kick it to like a 0.5. That's kind of what, what that is, though. A little, yeah. Um, 
But you're right. At a certain level on this test, people scoring 170 and above, this wasn't a section of games that was probably going to cost them a point um, in the same way that it would need to to loosen the curve at that level. Now, do I think it probably loosened it at a 155 or 160? Yeah, I do. So then the question becomes, why do we not think that it changes at the 170 level? And I'll answer that question. Okay, I have answers too, but I'm curious about yours. I think you'll agree with me. Because the first three games in there don't kill you. They may take some time, as in that third game, but like with the first couple of games, a lot of students that I talk to and what I know about those games from their, their setups and the construction, people felt good about those. The problem is when you take a set like this and you, the last game is rough, everybody remembers the last kiss that they got on this game set and it wasn't a good one. They're like, ah, they feel bad about it. They don't remember feeling a little bit better about the early part of the section and feeling more optimistic when the romance with that section was young. They just remember the bad breakup at the end. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, I mean, typically the most recent thing and obviously the most traumatizing. Exactly. So, but yeah, for, for me, my take is very similar. The first two games allowed you to bank a lot of time. Confidently, comfortably, you're basically ahead of the clock. Game three, senior and junior employees. It was time consuming, but good test takers tend to manage that fairly well. And this last game with beer, even if you had to brute force it, you probably had 10 plus minutes to do so. At least that's the reports that I was hearing from high scores. In which case, again, the damage is minimal, if any. And that's the key, high scores. Yeah. So we're talking about a scaling for 170. That's, you know, things flow down from that. But when we look at that section, uh, people came out and they're like, that last game was tough. They weren't like, that section was tough. That tells you so much right there where it's like, I felt fine. And then I slowed down in the third game and then I struggled with the last game. And especially at 160, that's going to move the needle for you. That gives yeah. you more latitude. So if you're sitting there thinking, look, I'm not at the 170 level, I'm at the 160 level, then it gives you a little bit more latitude. But overall, at the top, no change. Sorry. Yeah, I know there's people disappointed to hear that. Probably 170 plus PTers hearing that, being like, you guys are wrong. Everybody so I'll add this way. little footnote. Um, you've got to go off your own experience too. This is our take, but neither one of us sat for the test. I haven't actually done the beer game. So for those of you that have, especially those of you with some context of call it history and experience, you can weigh it against what you've done before and make an informed judgment coupled with ours. So it could be, again, that that does loosen it by one. Um, I don't think it will. Everybody's entitled to their own opinion. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go to this, that's what you just said. That's the, let's go to the next logic game section that we know was real. And this was the nonprofit, charity, the reserved seats, unreserved seats at sporting events, the jewels in the cases, and the train station posters. To me, this is a very similar section to the one we just talked about. Ends rough, uh, not impossible, same type of uh, no effect on the 170 scaling. So everybody after logic games is still at, you can miss seven questions or minus seven you see it online after this, for that 170. Yeah, and Sorry. I'll say the same thing about this set of games as well. That train station posters game that had a pattern feel to it, it wasn't easy. It definitely caught people off guard, especially people who weren't paying attention to us these past couple of months. Um, so it's possible it could have loosened it. I just, I didn't see anything here where good test takers never found their footing. And that to me is usually the hallmark of a game section that's going to have an effect up high, up top. Yeah, and it loosens the downscale. Uh, yeah. not at this level. To me, one hard game is not going to be enough to move it at the top. It's going to take more than that. And I didn't see that out of either one of these sections. So, Unless it's something truly objectively penalizing, like the virus game, computer virus game from September 2016, I, even great test takers were like, killed me. That's not one difficult game. That's one super difficult game. Fair. Or not one hard game. Uh, that's like an extraordinary event of its own kind of black hole power, which just sucked <laughs> everybody in. Yeah. That's like an All extinction right. event. Let's go to RC. John, I'll let you cover the uh, the two okay. RC passages. And again, as you mentioned, just two. Let's start with the one we saw Friday morning from January 2020. This was the section with international cybersecurity and illegal crimes online, Native American mobilian pigeon jargon, the science of aging and senescence, and then uh, Vermeer and Van Meegeren art forgeries. This was hard. That last passage in particular, I know a lot of people struggled with. Senescence in the science of aging isn't easy either. So I don't think people really got a break here, which makes me think 
This section, it's real, loosens the curve by one. So after games, you were at a minus seven. Anybody who got these passages, I would say, is now at a minus eight for 170. Disputes? Disagreements? Yeah, Clarification? I, cover the second set, and right. then let's have that conversation. The other passages that we saw on both main testing days um, were about the Mexican photographer, Graciela, water use and privatization, uncivil and civil obedience and disobedience, uh, and then Galileo and Dante's Inferno. I have the same take on this. There were more than one hard passage here, justifiably difficult at the highest level. I think this is also going to loosen the scale by one. Okay. So both of these move, uh, move it looser by one, goes from minus seven to minus eight for everybody at this point. Yeah. Interestingly enough, I would say that these two passage sets, I can, I, you know, I almost feel like there's a 0.5 version inside this. I don't think these affect things downscale. Like, I don't think they're as hard as some of the classic difficult passages, passage sets of the past. Yeah, I think I'm that's having a hard time expressing what this is. Sometimes you see reading comprehension and it's just psychic damage everywhere. That's a terrible section and it crushed everybody at all levels. And especially test takers who struggle with RC really got worked over. Yeah. I'm not saying these weren't hard. I'm saying that I don't think they had that same level of damage correlation. The collateral damage on this as you went downscale wasn't as bad. So I don't think that that's all of a sudden loosening the lower level scales even more so. I don't think they're affected by this. It's kind of in the way the games did affect it, these don't. I think there's a counterbalancing uh, aspect a little bit where almost you can say, well, maybe that game section wasn't zero. It was 0.5. And that reading comp wasn't one. It was 0.5. So together, the combinations add up to moving the scale by one. But by themselves, we've made it binary because uh, to do otherwise is incredibly confusing. Yeah, but I do like the nuance of how you explained it. To me, there's almost like this notion of impenetrability at certain levels. And it takes a lot to really punish a 170 type of test taker. To me, the reading comp had a greater potential to do so than the games did here. But I, I also that. think that there's probably an inverted effect or outcome at, say, a 152 or a 158. Yeah. I agree with you there. So let's move to LR. So we're at minus eight for everybody. Uh, first set of sections was the one about insulin tree rings, uh, the jumping frogs, the CFCs, the caffeine in, in, and tea and coffee. We think this was a medium, very reasonable. You know, it's hard again, but it's medium difficulty. We don't think this moves the scale. And again, uh, so you'd be at minus eight. If that was your lineup, that was your LR, you're at minus eight. And then we look at the January 20 section that was used on Friday and Saturday, like Dragonflies, Romeo and Juliet Theater, the Mesopotamian recipe book, Synthetic Blood, also no effect. And so zero and zero there, which means, John, that every single scale combination of the eight ends up at, at the 170 level, you can miss eight questions to get a 170. Yeah. And, and knowing us, I want to dispel a criticism that would be fair in most cases, which I'd be a pretty lazy way to do it <laughs> on our end, where just everybody has the same thing. Uh, but I genuinely feel with only eight scored sections or eight possible combinations here, then that is kind of the only possible outcome that I see as realistic. I think every test that we saw is probably a minus eight for 170. And, you know, not that and defense is needed here, but there have been tests where we have said there's all sorts of different possible outcomes, sure. seven, eight, nine. Uh, so it's not a matter of laziness. It's a matter of this is what we perceive as the, the way it lines up. I'm very comfortable with this. You and I had a, I felt a good grasp of what was going on. Yeah. Talk a little bit about how these curves get affected moving down into, say, the 165, 160, 155. Like how many questions can you miss in that particular yeah, range? Yeah, a lot of people are interested in that. Maybe I shouldn't have said lazy. I should have said something like accidentally convenient or something. John, we worked like, I mean, just speak Yeah, early. trust me. They're... We worked like crazy on Friday and Saturday. Easy 20 hours <laughs> plus for both of us. Lazy is the last word that comes to mind on those two days. I won't accept it. Uh, yeah, this information is just stained with sweat and blood and tequila. <laughs> uh, so this he, is hard, hard earned. But yeah, let me talk scale, about what I think this does to the scaling a little further down. So I'm going to base this off of what I think were 76 questions regardless. I think both scored LRs were 26. Um, it could be the one was 25. We've got I can't remember right now. Yeah. So let's, let's play this off of a 
76 question curve, and you can adjust one up or down if you had a, a different number of LR. But I think a minus eight test translates, this minus eight test translates into this. At 165, I suspect you can miss 14. So 61 or 62, correct, depending on how many questions you had. At a 160, I guess here, and again, this is where you can start to see a bit of a change, you could miss 21. So 54 or 55, depending on your question count. And then a little further down at 155, um, I think it softens even further, which you could miss 29 to get that score. 46 or 47, correct? Nice. Yeah. So you can see that depending on where you are along this range, the forgiveness or the strictness of this changes a little bit because we can see how this would affect people at different levels. Exactly. And, you know, this is always uh, part, you know, science, mathematics, part uh, forecast, part magic. Part, Alchemy. Yeah. yeah, guessing. You put it all together. I feel pretty good. We've been in the past uh, very accurate about scale predictions when we've had the opportunity to then find out what the final scale was later on. And so I feel pretty comfortable about the way this will play out. But that is the rundown. Hopefully for some of you, that was good news about what was real and what was experimental. Uh, we know all those sections that we talked about being real were in fact real. So there was, there's no doubt about it. Uh, and that pretty much sums up the August test. A good one for us. You and I were happy very early on. I think we maintained our happiness as much as you can in, in, in going through an LSAT. Um, I'm hoping that September is equally useful. And that's the final point that I want to add to this, which mm -hmm. is the crystal ball that we did for August, we feel also applies perfectly, maybe more perfectly than we even expected to September as well. So if you didn't get a chance to check it out live when we did it a little while back, it is in every PowerScore student's student center online. Whether you take our analytics package, you sign up for an on-demand course, you take a live course, and if you do, come join me next Wednesday, uh, <laughs> or you do tutoring. If you have access to an online student center with us, you have access to that video and the recommended problem sets, and it is full speed ahead for September, where we think that's still going to apply. If you want to get access to it, there are ways to do that as well. You can become a student. Exactly. And what I would say is, if you are a current student, and I hope you are, thank you, <laughs> uh, and you're going back in there, you're like, I'm pointed towards September. How does this change things? Go into the segment that I talked about where I was like, this is what the possible tests are. You now know that the first test that I recommended there was January 2020. There were two others that I talked about in that segment. You can remove January 2020. They won't reuse it this quickly. So this content is gone, but move to the second and third exams that we recommended in that particular grouping. So we always kind of like line them up like these are the most likely candidates. Uh, this was number one, uh, but now you can just remove that and the next two would be the next two up. And so that sets you up for September. Yeah, there you go. And the recommended problem sets still apply, I think, equally as well to September. We didn't base those solely off of January 2020. It included all of the exams that Dave just referred to that we suspected were candidates. So keep working through those problems. I promise you'll be glad you did. Yeah, and now that we're done with this, we'll probably uh, take a look at those, maybe tweak one or two things in there yeah. as well. But uh, we just had to get through this test and see exactly what the content was. So either way, that's available to you if you're one of our students. And uh, if so, please take advantage of it. We know that it will help you, and uh, we'd love to hear about it. And again, the final score release on this comes out Wednesday, August 31st at 9 a.m. Eastern. John and I will be around. I'll probably be awake. He probably won't. But, uh, you know, reach out and let us know how things went. We'd love to hear it. And on that note, if you get a chance, please subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, or anywhere else you may find it in the world. If you enjoyed it, please leave us a comment and a rating as well. And I know that we're going to be doing a mailbag soon. So if you have any questions about the LSAT, the way all this works, you know, the value of, you know, different ways of studying, law school admissions, the upcoming cycle, send those to us at LSATpodcast at powerscore.com. And we will cover those in an upcoming episode. On behalf of John and myself, thanks so much for listening. Have a great week. Stay safe. Thank you.